All right, everybody, welcome to session 19A, Construction and Alternative Delivery. My name is Casey Gish. I'm your moderator slash stamp holder slash stamp guard. So if you do need CEUs, um, you can just drop your sheet in the back there. I'm kind of trying to organize them by alphabetical order. So folks can just grab them on the way out. That'll be a good test of how well I know the alphabet. Um, so uh, our presentation is by Mike Kahn. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes or so, roughly by the end for um, four questions. We will have the live stream going and folks in the room, so I'll need to use the microphone for questions. And then I'll be monitoring the chat. So folks that are, are online, please, I encourage you to put questions in the chat. Um, so without further ado, Mike Kahn. Mike is our J, is a JUB water treatment group regional lead who has been with JUB for nearly 20 years. Mike's work includes program management for water and wastewater systems throughout the mountain interwest, excuse me, intermountain west. All right, there you go, Mike. Awesome. If I uh, start to drone off, wave your hand at me so I make sure I'm on the microphone. Um, so this presentation is kind of a culmination of the last two and a half, well, I guess about almost three years now, but um, issues that everybody's been dealing with, right? So uh, we've had a lot of conversations and you hear a lot of different entities and contractors and suppliers and everybody's facing the same struggles. Um, and so what we've tried to do here is pull some of those conversations into something that is maybe tangible um, that we can kind of share with the group. I'm really hoping at the end of this that maybe it's a few hands go up and say, yeah, we're trying these ideas and these things. Um, I'm hoping that it'll maybe spur some of those conversations. Uh, what I've found is there's getting to be some pretty creative solutions that people are coming up with. And maybe there's a paradigm shift in how we are managing projects, um, collaborating differently. Um, you know, traditional hard lines contractually are starting to get um, blurred, but also defined differently, maybe. Um, so I'm going to kind of give that background to it. Uh, the other piece is, I guess, I don't claim to be an attorney and I don't claim to be an economist. This is just me as an engineer working through these things um, and bringing, bringing information back. So I'll go ahead and start walking through some of this. I think from an outline standpoint, the first maybe third of it is really just kind of wrapping our head around why we're even in this situation. Um, lots of charts, lots of things to point at. Probably seen a lot of it on the news, but uh, it is kind of interesting to see kind of the history and what these triggers were and how things happen. Um, and then the last half, you know, really talking through kind of some mitigation strategies for capital projects, which are kind of the big ticket items. Um, but there's also ongoing O&M. We've had all sorts of other things that have gone on that are impacting utilities. Uh, and then a little bit of labor um, discussion. That's, I think, affecting the entire industry, uh, water, you know, wastewater in general. And then, like I said, Kind of an open discussion. I, I, every time I talk this conversation with people, I find something new. So it's it's been pretty interesting that way. So so what are the supply chain challenges? Right, we've got scarcity of materials, um, almost non-existent at times. Um, then once you do find them, you can't really get a firm price. And so without a firm price, you're going into things somewhat blind sometimes. And then lead times are also the giant question mark. Right. Um, they can't be held <laughs> because people are uh, unable to hold them because of labor shortages, uh, material shortages for components, so, you know, and assemblies and things like that. So all those things coupled together just turn into kind of a firestorm. And, you know, that is that is the supply chain issue that we're running into. So I'm going to go back and try to walk through this. So I don't know that these are in chronological order by any stretch, but I think they're worth talking through. So COVID pretty obvious, right? We came out of 2019 high on the world and uh, got clobbered, right? In March of 20. And it, it, we'll talk through kind of some of the charts and you can kind of see some of that, but um, that was just one of the first triggers. And then it compounded from there, right? We have labor issues that are, I got a typo, I'm sorry, <laughs> manufacturing labor. Um, so we got labor shortages, uh, you know, we had some natural disaster things. There was a Texas freeze. I don't know if everybody remembers that one. Um, We've got port labor shortages. Uh, we've got the Ukrainian wars kicked off here. We've got the cargo ship in the Suez Canal that 
blocked, you know, a third of the transport for a period of time. Um, and now we're facing some of these hyperinflation and fuel price things that are kind of gone out of hand. So all that coupled together has created this situation that we are now dealing with daily. It's not really a singular event. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. What's the other, the other piece of this that's kind of interesting is as you talk to people, um, it's not just one element, right? So raw materials have gone up and which in turn turns this manufacturing step up. It costs more to transport it and get it there. And so it's compounding at every, every step along the way. And so you get this you know, kind of a compounding interest situation going on, right? Where it's not just one layer, but every layer has an additional cost. And so that has blown these things out of proportion. Um, when they get right down to the, the end user. So this one's a, I mean, you can pull these charts all over the internet, right? But um, labor shortage thing was interesting. So this is unemployment. Um, you know, we were at a fairly low unemployment rate going into COVID. We shut down, right? And you see the giant spike. And coming out of that, what happens, right? We, we stopped manufacturing during that period close quarters jobs were pretty much off the ticket, right? So if you were standing next to somebody, that wasn't happening, or they were, they cut production in half, right? They, they turned shift assembly line work into much slower process. So everything slowed down. The other piece they did is they sold off all their shelf stock. <laughs> Everybody said, well, go home, but we've got a bunch of things on the shelf. So they sold all that stuff off and that didn't exist, right? You've seen that in the rental car industry. Um, all the rental car companies sold their cars off. So coming out of this, we, we'd go to rent a car, get a rental car and they didn't have them. Um, so what that did though, is it created this pent up need for materials and labor and production on the back end of COVID. Everybody was sitting there on the sidelines with a bunch of money. So the result, right? Spring of 21, the vaccines come out, uh, things start in again. And we've got this rapid influx of let's get moving, um, huge demand, but somewhat slow response by the manufacturing industry, right? Um, uh, vaccines, whether for them or against them, however that works, it's your choice. But the reality was is it didn't, didn't snap our fingers and like everything went back to normal. So we have this giant misalignment in supply demand and that has created the, the disruption, if you will. I mean, a couple of snippets, right? I mean, there was trillions of dollars on the sideline for months and they were just waiting for something to happen. And that all that money started hitting back into the into our industry. So as we go forward, like we start thinking about what do we look at for um, the metrics? What, how do we track cost in increases and things like that? Um, there's a few different ways of doing it. These are just a few that I'm pulling together here, right? So there's a producer price index, which is more of the uh, what it costs to produce the goods, um, consumer price index, which is on the receiving end where you're actually what you see as a purchaser. And then there's a, you know, a conglomerate, if you will, what we kind of look at in our industry with the construction cost index. Um, they're all somewhat indicative um, of the various pieces and they're kind of, it's kind of, it's a, it's informative to be able to look at them independently um, because they all couple together in different ways. So this is a generic goods producer price index, right? So uh, this is one year increase year over year. This is a 12 month year rolling year over year increase. And so what you see is coming out of 2020, right? It kind of went to nothing and even a net decrease because they actually stopped production on this production lines so we're selling off um, shelf items. And so you got this actual net negative for the year. Uh, but coming on the back end of that, right, you see a 20% increase from, from the low in the summer of 2020-ish. Fuel, um, everybody's pretty well experienced that. Hopefully maybe we're getting through and moderating that to some degree. But I mean, the reality is, is since September 20, we're up double at least, uh, 100, 100 plus percent increase. Metals, metal products, uh, they have been impacted in different ways. <laughs> uh, metal products, so what, for our industry, what was interesting is uh, the Texas freeze happened, right? And we, got, we lost a lot of our production and our um, uh, supply for PVC pipe, resin-based pipes, HGPE, things like that. So a lot of people shifted to ductile. Well, it depleted the supply of ductile iron and steel pipes. 
Um, so these, these responses have also impacted one another. Um, the other one is the Ukraine war, right? So I think Russia produces somewhere between 15 and 20% of the nickel on the planet. Uh, nickel is one of the primary constituents in stainless. So stainless saw like a 200% jump in one day. Um, and that has moderated to some degree as the other manufacturers have started to produce up, but there's this lag response. Everything is, is just a slow response. Plastics, same thing, up at least 40%. And what you'll notice is even, and I mean, you can stretch these charts out. What you'll find is they were reasonably level for a long period of time. I mean, it's not, I've kind of given, you know, like a five-year back window or whatever, but I mean, it wasn't like we had these giant peaks in the last 10, 15 years. They, everything has been reasonably moderate. So consumer price index was really interesting. So red block here, right? That is kind of all items. So we're seeing a, about a 9% increase in just the last year. Um, fuel by itself, though, is 40%. <laughs> What's interesting about this chart is if you looked at it for the maybe a year before that, right? It's those are normally three and five or something like that on, on a bad year. I mean, these these numbers are just out of hand, is what it amounts to. And where does that all leave us with construction? So construction, uh, this was pulled from an AGC document that got published beginning of the year, so it's probably even changed again. Um, we're seeing almost a twenty percent increase, right, as a conglomerate. So going into projects, right, uh, capital projects anyways, there's, that's a pretty big number to be just, you know, flailing around. And where does inflation head from here? Um, I would say if I knew that, I'd be a stockbroker, not an engineer. But uh, I think I've seen a couple different charts that show more of a shouldering back in where they're saying it'll, it's going to be high for maybe the next few years. I've seen this chart, which shows it maybe optimistically dropping back to somewhat of a norm by 23. Um, I think anybody's best guess is probably real at this point. But, uh, you know, the economists are trying to look at that, that impact of those changes to the federal you know, reserve rate. That, that has an initial response um, and how long that response stays every time they make an adjustment. Um, I think that's probably going to be uh, more indicative of what's going to go on with inflation. So from here, uh, we'll keep talking about mitigation strategies. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the premise of this, right? Everything's up, everything's out of hand. It's all volatile. Um, so we'll kind of talk through, put some maybe some sideboards on ideas and options and things to think about as you go into capital projects. Um, We'll talk about capital and o &M together. Uh, some of the strategies are kind of interchangeable in some ways, some ways they aren't, but the reality is it's affecting kind of everybody along the way, right? Uh, show of hands, how many suppliers are in here? Equipment folks? Just Mike, we'll blame you, Mike. <laughs> uh, but I mean, the reality is it goes from suppliers to contractors, right? Um, engineers, owners, everybody has to deal with this thing along the way, right? We're from planning documents and, and are we changing how we do those things? Uh, solutions aren't really one size fits all. Um, you know, you might have a small project that it's much different than a large project um, and, and, and different approaches for capital projects versus o &M. So we'll break those up and kind of put some ideas out there. So let's just talk capital projects for a while. What's the first one? Just don't build it, delay, right? Um, this is kind of a, sounds great in theory, right? We'll let the vault market volatility calm down. We assume these great big spikes, right? Optimistically, you know, things will, things will get better. Uh, I think that is probably the, the, the most dangerous one, right? It's probably not going to get better. It's probably going to be some, some level higher and you're going to get caught with the inflation game, right? So just delaying might, might deal with some, you know, if you have, if you're bidding as all steel, water tank and steel is extremely volatile for some reason right at the moment, right? That might make sense to let things moderate. Um, but you can also run the risk of things continue to go up, right? And so I, I think it's worth worth contemplating though, right? I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of projects that are not imminent and they're not regulatory driven or they're not, you know, um, growth need that just has to happen. So it, it is not off the table, um, but most of the time you probably can't wait. 
Um, so as an owner, you know, what, what can you do? What the reality is what we're talking about is risk sharing, right? Um, who owns it? Um, what level of risk tolerance do you have? You know, there's some entities that have, you know, fixed budget, if you will. Um, you know, they're on some sort of revenue bond or something like that for a capital project. And so there, there is a true cap, you know, versus, um, you know, a larger entity that might have some flexibility to, you know, phase projects or move money, you know, earlier or later for a project. Um, so that level of risk tolerance uh, changes depending on who you are. Uh, and then I think the piece that we'll really move into in the next few slides is really how do you share that risk contractually, um, which is kind of some of these delivery mechanisms. But I think that's really what we're talking about. And then uh, budgeting. I mean, I don't want to, this is one bullet for something that is a major piece of the whole pie, right? Which is how do you, how do you allocate funds when you have potentially 20% increase in costs and construction? Um, you know, going into those budgeting cycles much differently nowadays, it's, it's, it's a different animal. Uh, and it isn't just the supply chain issue, right? So what we're struggling with in a lot of capital projects is there, we're mid construction, the contractor says, I can't get that material, right? I can't get PVC pipe, but I can get you ductile or I can get you steel and, you know, on a different timeline. And so then you're, you're also having this reevaluation or redesign midstream and those, those all impact costs, impact delays, and all that is kind of coupled together. Um, but it isn't just the hard cost of the actual materials. So contractual risk sharing, right? So um, how do we do that? So we talk about a risk register, um, folks that are really into the alternative delivery options, you know, that is one of the first things to do. You identify your risks. Uh, the severity of them, um, the impact that they would have on your project. And then you define what your tolerance is for those things, right? And loosely talked about that a little bit, but you know, a schedule delay may be crucial for one job and not crucial for another. Uh, budget impact may be extremely difficult for one, but not another. Uh, so, so that risk register, if you will, identifies kind of the highest priority things. And then, um, Kind of moves them down the list and also their probability of actually occurring uh you know some of these materials are have been pretty good and pretty stable there's other things that are extremely volatile and scarce um and then from there you start looking at the contractual mechanisms to manage that that risk allocation along the along the process uh, again these are pretty you know complicated contractual mechanisms um and I don't want to belabor that, but that's kind of where we head. So most, most public entities, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of public entities are on the traditional design bid build, you know, mechanism. Um, a few little things that we're starting to see people do, right? We're opening and broadening performance-based specs, um, a little less strict, if you will, uh, allows some contractor and supplier innovation. Um, that is a double-edged sword, right? You open you up and you're going to get options that maybe you don't want, but it is something that you have to really think about, right? If you have written a spec over the years that has narrowed things down to one supplier, you know, that's something you probably should be contemplating. Um, you know, you, you want to have at least a viable opportunity for them to contractually to provide material substitutions um, and not just, you know, cut that mechanism off. Um, definitions for cost and time change management. You know, I think uh, th this has been interesting because our water wastewater industry is not probably as advanced, I would say, as some of the like uh, transportation industry, right? So I know in Idaho, like uh, Department of Transportation, they track their own fuel index and their own asphalt index, and they make adjustments during the project up and down for those indices. Uh, and so that, that takes and manages that risk differently. I mean, it's a little different animal where they are the entity that controls the, the, the budget as well as the, the, the payout, but it does help them at least be fair with the contractors. So if there is a crazy increase that the contractor isn't gonna go belly up and it mitigates that legal realm, you know, somewhat ahead of time. Uh, Pre-procuring materials in advance. I mean, that's, that, that is kind of the name of the game right now. Uh, long lead items. And the trick is which one's the long lead item. <laughs> um, it could be any one item. It could be any one item that holds up the show. 
Um, but there are, you know, we're starting to see a few of those, uh, I would call them traditionally long lead items that are um, being outstaged, up or upstaged by some of the new things, right? Uh, anything with the chip in it nowadays, right, is the new, the new thing. We're looking at HVAC controllers on a wall that nobody can get because they're they got those little microchips that everybody wants. Um, the other mechanism there is trying to build that timeline on your contracts so that you have a an opportunity for the contractor to procure those materials or at least get them into the pipeline and coming so you don't experience those delays later. Phasing it, um, I mean, there's conversations about making sure they got all their materials on the ground before you ever even start. I, that might be a stretch, but um, at least those are things to be thinking about. So I have get, devoted an entire whole slide to alternative delivery, which is a whole world by itself, right? Um, these are the collaborative you know, contracting approaches. Uh, CMGC, CMAR, contractor, contract, construction manager at risk, um, design build and progressive design build. Those are great opportunities um, to really bring in specialists that are quite frankly, the guys that are doing this every day. Um, you know, the contractors are seeing that they're working with the suppliers hand in hand and they're understanding kind of the, and keeping their finger on the pulse of where those materials are. And I think, I think, you know, from a legal standpoint, there's some uh, funding mechanisms that allow it, some that don't, some states that are different. Uh, but I, I think it is, it is probably where a lot of our industry is headed. Uh, just to mitigate some of the contractual mechanisms and issues that we're running into. Uh, much more uh, opportunity there to have open and candid conversations about budgets and schedules and delays uh, than with a traditional design bid build project. So let's talk O&M stuff, right? Like day-to-day -day consumables at water and wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, one of the things I, I sat in on a couple, an AWA webinar here a while back that was kind of nationwide, and they had some interesting things that people are starting to do. Um, a lot of entities are starting to actually hire and get people who are trained procurement specialists, right? They're purely contract people. Uh, They're starting to, you know, a lot of smaller entities or even mid-sized entities don't really have somebody that's a dedicated procurement person, right? They've got to we got an operator that says, I need this, and they get it over to finance, and finance makes the, cuts the PO. Um, we're talking about people who are, who are building you know, RFQs so that they're getting multiple quotes from multiple vendors. They're really reviewing those terms and conditions for deliveries. Uh, this, this was really promulgated by the chlorine supply shortage thing we had a couple of years, maybe a year ago now. Um, you know, there was, people had contracts and they realized they didn't, have a, they didn't have a reliable supply chain for getting chlorine to their plants. Um, EPA, frankly, stepped in and tried to, tried to make sure that that was a priority from a nationwide standpoint, but it still wasn't necessarily getting trickled down to even those super small entities. Um, coming out of that, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of them learned was uh, note issues as they pop up. So we've got a lot of these suppliers that were there was kind of this initial, right? We were getting capped allocations to some of these chlorine suppliers. They were getting short deliveries and they didn't, they were like, oh, they only dropped off 500 gallons instead of a thousand this month. And everybody kind of shrugged it off for the first month. And then, you know, it, it was a precursor. And even the suppliers, the middlemen, so to speak, didn't really know what was going on until it was kind of already a problem. Um, so keeping, uh, keeping our eye, I guess, on those sorts of things, uh, as well as understanding transportation issues on a kind of a regional and global level. Um, you know, there was, there was a rail line issue, you know, or, or one facility had a fire and there, that ripples into all of a sudden, you know, huge demand from another production facility and they go to zero. Um, that whole process is, is, is that kind of new norm for us. Uh, timeline impacts. So that's been interesting. Um, uh, some of the bigger cities are doing some really unique things. Um, changing how you're, we're warehousing. I mean, you know, we traditionally, right, might have a spare valve in the, the, the yard or something like that, or a few. We're seeing a lot of these entities that are starting to build their own warehouses for their regularly used items. Uh, 
<laughs> I saw some shared warehousing conversations. People were, you know, getting multiple entities together and building a yard. So they don't have, you know, it's sort of a, um, together, hopefully they don't have all the same issues at the same time, but maybe they can have a little bit of spares for, for several different things, you know, thousand feet, eight inch pipe sitting there and a few valves and um, some, some things on the hand because the local warehouses are not supply, doing that anymore. Um, this, the last bullet there was really interesting to me. Um, they were actually talking about trying to get local suppliers to essentially have an on built re, repopulate their shelf stock, um, which sounds great if they can actually get it. Um, but a lot of them are saying they, they, you know, we just don't do that anymore, <laughs> which is kind of a strange little twist. Um, but actually saying every time we buy something, we want you to re replenish whatever we want and have, you know, a thousand feet of pipe on retainer. So when we walk in, we can actually get it. And uh, that's a, that's an interesting public private relationship that I don't know how you cross that, but uh, you know, maybe that's part of those RFQs and, and part of their proposal that comes back. So these are things that are, as I said, kind of a paradigm shift on how we actually may interact in our contractual mechanisms going forward. Uh, yeah, contracting approaches, dual sourcing, um, uh, a lot of entities, you know, using cooperative purchasing type of approaches. Uh, not sure how many of you are, or have done that with SourceWell or OpenGov. There's a lot of different ones that are out there, but that's essentially piggyback procurement. So these uh, entities go out and they procure and solicit and get a, essentially a, a best price for different things, whether it be, you know, anything that a municipality might have, fire trucks or police cars or pipe or something, right? That's a commodity. Um, and they get the established price. So you can kind of cut that uh, timeline out where you can just walk in and say, I want this and cut the PO and, and get that process moving versus having to go through a four to six week RFQ process. Uh, assessment of your vendor's capabilities. Uh, what we saw with the chlorine thing was there was a lot of middlemen, so to speak, and maybe even third tier handlers. You know, they didn't have a direct connection to the actual raw material supplier. And what we found was those guys got their commodities cut off sooner than other folks. And so some of the very small entities were, were really left hanging really quickly. Um, bigger faci facilities were getting tanker truck level. They were probably, there was less of a middleman issue. And, you know, they were able to at least kind of get right to the direct supplier. Another thing that came out of that was uh, EPA in a direct response to the um, chlorine shortage generated this uh, chemical supplier locator tool. So it's a ArcGIS map. Essentially you can go in there and I've thrown the link on there. You can go check it out for yourself, but basically it maps all the different various chemical suppliers and what their capabilities are across the US. Uh, doesn't give their exact address, but it gives contact info <laughs> for terrorist reasons, <laughs> they don't want the actual facility names, you know, broadcasted, but as a, you know, verifiable entity as, you know, a municipality or whatever that might be, you can, you can go in there and track that down and, you know, figure out if there's an alternative supplier for whatever that chemical it is that you, you need. I thought that was kind of interesting. I never seen that before. So let's talk labor force. Um, we'll keep moving through this. So labor, you know, that's kind of an interesting, right? So it, it affects everybody. It's engineers, you know, operations, everybody along the way. Um, the reality is, is it's impacting construction timelines. We're getting contractor delays. We're getting existing employees being, you know, worked essentially more than they want to be often case. And, and that, that is creating this, this compounding issue. Um, through a few little Idaho tidbits I've gathered up, you know, what we're, what the reality is, is we're getting pressured by a lot of movement of people too. Um, we're getting some really crazy housing price markets and economies going on. Um, Idaho has been really affected where I'm from, uh, you know, and that is, that is driving uh, kind of that shift of how we may need to respond to, to dealing with that. So, so what are the employees doing, right? They're, they're either moving out of those high-priced areas that are being, they're being pushed out of, 
or, you know, we're making offers and trying to get people to relocate and come in and take these jobs and they can't, they, they get down to the wire and they can't move because they, the cost of living is so out of hand. Um, both of those issues, whether it's somebody that's already on staff or somebody that's coming in, they can't, we can't deal with that and, and stay functional. So what are, what are employers doing? I, and I don't know that they're actually doing it, but there's a lot of conversations. Um, remote work, that sounds great for people who have a desk job, but it's not real great for folks that got to go out and do something, right? Swing a hammer or pick up a shovel. Uh, split shift, you know, changing those work hours. Um, had a conversation. Flexibility is the new name, right? Whatever mechanism that is you can give to people. Um, the last ones are kind of interesting. So I, I've heard a few of these conversations started and I think, I think it may be where we're headed. Uh, shift housing. So think operation staff operating more like a fire station where the crew comes in, they've got a, you know, bunkhouse and they've got a place to stay so they can live, you know, an hour and a half commute away or something. They come in, they work three days, three 12 hour shifts, and then they're out of here for four days or vice versa. And I think that may be some of the stuff that we're going to start seeing. Um, I've seen some entities talking about temporary or transitional housing to buffer that move into an area. Um, we get the people that say, yeah, I can't, I can't find a place even to move. So sorry, I'm going to pass on your job, right? Do you give them a two months in a, in a rental house or whatever it might be? Um, can't say that these are all even in action yet, but there are conversations going on. And I think, I think it may be that it's, um, you know, things that we are, we're gonna have to look into. So what else are um, employers doing, right? Travel assistance, I've heard Uber credits, public transport, transportation credits for buses and, you know, light rail stuff. Um, vehicle allowances as part of the benefit packages, you know, so they can, you know, that, that becomes part of their uh, opportunity to work someplace. And dare I say it, more inflation, right? Increased wages. That's, it's unfortunately the last thing that gets talked about, but that's the reality of it. That's, that's probably where we're headed. So summary, like recap, there's, there's no silver bullet here. I don't claim to have any of those. Um, what I have found interesting is I, I, every time I talk to somebody about this, I learned some idea or some thing that some entity or group is trying to, um, you know, pursue. So, you know, look at the, look at what the risk is for your situation. Look at your risk tolerance of, you know, how do you, how, how can you handle something happening in that supply chain? Um, Look at your strategies ahead of time. Be proactive. Don't just be like, uh, you know, I think the idea of optimism is kind of out the window at these, this point. Um, we'll probably be all right. That, I don't think that's real anymore. I think you go into every project thinking, what happens if we have a major material supply issue? How are we going to deal with it? Um, and then that reassessment, you know, routinely, you know, for especially for O&M type products, you know, it's not just, hey, we, all, we have a good supplier. It's like maybe annually you need to reassess are these guys, you know, still viable. Um, now, like I said, just on the fly, be creative. I think there's a lot of creativity coming out of this that probably hasn't, <laughs> hasn't had to be in the industry in, in the past. So. so we've got lots of time for questions, comments. I'll throw it out there. Anybody? We have about seven minutes or so for questions. Anybody? Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, what you thought about maybe adding one more thing on that is maybe just starting earlier, just to, you know, like you said, with the labor shortage, and, you know, I mean, just things may take longer, not only, you know, and also just the manufacturing, but just doing, getting projects up and running, executing things like that as, yeah. as another strategy of, oh, for sure. of mitigating that. Times your, times your, <laughs> one thing you got, you, you can actually count on, right? The, the other thing, I mean, I, the elephant in the room that I didn't really broach is what do you do with the contracts you have in place that are right now, right? That we bid a year ago and we're dealing with, th those are the hard ones. I mean, frankly, this is all kind of forward looking. The stuff we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis for contracts that are out there on the street, that's, that's where the pain's at right now, you know? Good luck. <laughs> everybody's everybody's in the same boat there, right? 
right? Um, but I think our, we have to lift our head up and, and at least be thinking ahead for the next thing. Um, so. I'm wondering if you've actually seen a case study where an owner has incorporated um, cost escalation risk sharing into a contract, into a bidding process. I feel like I've heard a lot of talk about it, but at the end of the day, folks are like, what do we base this off of? How does this work? And I'm wondering if, if you I have seen, seen a lot of pre-procurement. I have not. Um, I'm trying to think if we have. Yeah, actually I have. Uh, we, we have done it with um, membrane suppliers. So it was, and it was more, it was tied to, tied to CPI and it was tied to a very specific CPI, um, you know, because there's a lot of indices out there that you can track off of, um, but it was gone into both the supplier knew it going into it, as well as, you know, it, it was clear in the contract documents and it was more based on um, not knowing it, it was for the, both the benefit of the supplier and the owner, right, frankly. Um, and the terms were established and they had an opportunity during the bidding period to comment on the terms, right? And the intent was if it was a pre-procurement package. And so the idea was if the contract got delayed, right, that supplier would be, would have an opportunity to recoup those costs. And if, and vice versa, if, if they delayed the contractor in their scope of supply, um, there was a mechanism for controlling that. So. So yeah, it, it's a little more, it's a little easier when you can pick out that commodity. That's why I say steel would be very, you know, one, fra you know, some commodity specific. Um, our projects are not usually very specific, right? So um, yeah, it, it's, it's a little easier when you have a package or something that you can put your, put a bow on. Good job, Mike. Interesting stuff. A um, couple of things, uh, uh, owner operator standpoint, these are just comments, I guess. A couple of things that we've been doing a little bit is uh, some redundancy planning. <clears throat> so going through both of our treatment plants, all of our lift stations and looking for those microchip type of things. So PLCs, IO cards, um, batteries, anything that could fail that, you know, sometimes they're, they're on the shelf. Um, but sometimes you kind of have to dig into it and you might even find that you have some parts that are obsolete that you have to just buy off of eBay. And that might begin a different way of approaching that. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> also we've taken kind of a fresher look at our, our computerized maintenance management system, um, making sure that we have all of those components in our database, understand what spare parts we have and which ones we need. And that helps us keep, stay on top of the inventory. Yeah, the, the shelf thing is interesting, right? I, I didn't include it. We had a contractor brought one to us on the job, but it was, here's what, you know, a year ago, here's all the things that were, you know, on the shelf. These were eight weeks. These were 12 weeks, right? And now it's just all those columns shifted. <laughs> None of that's the, the, the quickest you're going to get something now is 12 weeks on these electrical components. And then it goes up from there. And so that, that whole shift has changed, right? You can't just walk in and buy fuses off the shelf, uh, you know, they just don't exist. Hey, Mike. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, there's a couple of things that we'll recommend as a supplier. If, if there are some critical components in your system that just cannot be down for very long, uh, the previous uh, question addressed this a little bit, it is prudent to have whatever spares on hand now. Don't wait you know, to, for something to go offline. Uh, and that's something that we're really trying to, to help customers with right now and just identify, okay, where are your, your key components and, and get those in, in hand just so that they're not dead in the water later. So we have about two minutes left. Any additional questions for Mike? What has your experience been with the regulators on like project where timing's delayed or if it's got funding tied to it that uh, is impacted? So far, so good. <laughs> I mean, COVID, right, is define it how you want, right? But it's borderline plagues and pandemics, right? I mean, it, it, I think they're trying to understand that, um, 
everybody's doing their part. I think, I think that's been the interesting part to me is I don't, you know, for a while it's like, everybody's thinking, ah, everybody's, you know, these are just fake cost issues. Right. And contractors are looking for money and all that. When you really get down into it, right. What, what's going on is everybody's trying not to go broke. <laughs> they're just trying to get costs. They're, I mean, everybody, you know, there can be a, a bad egg in there somewhere, but for the most part, people are just trying not to completely lose their, their ass, so to speak. <laughs> um, and so I, and I think the regulators are in the same boat. They recognize, I mean, what are you going to do? If you can't get the parts and pieces and you can't turn it on, I mean, I, I mean, is finding that entity and, and just clobbering them a, uh, uh, solution maybe but it doesn't solve the issue uh, it's, it's so I, I think everybody's trying to pull on the oars the same direction right. thank you mike awesome. yep.